487. So I understand that Ray went back to the hospital tonight? Okay. Okay. Well, he's in our prayer constantly. Keep him in prayer. Megan left to go back to school uh, School Tuesday? Yesterday. Hannah went upstate with the boyfriend. And we go forward. <laughs> All right, 487. 487. Mm. Ooh, mercy. I am trying. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Let's do it. Three. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him the power of he. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Time alone, but for eternity. Once Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up, sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Jesus, Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of Long has enslaved me, his precious blood he gave to redeem. Now I belong to Jesus. All right, amen. Mercy. Put the fan on, honey. Put the fan on. You know where it is? Put the fan on, Chris. Yeah. He's got to put the fan on. Should be good. Yeah, it's a little warm now, I know. Nah, it's a little warm. A little, a little fan will be right. That feels a little better air. Get the air circulating. That feels a little better. Yeah, if Chris put it on. I feel it. It's good. Wow. Okay, Second Corinthians chapter uh Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. Woo, that feels better. That feels better. Wow. <laughs> but Ray, been through a lot, Ray, this year. May is May is a year. Is a year. May is a year. Ray's been through his ordeal. Started last May. Probably started April, but he 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 became aware of it in May. So I remember at the picnic in May, the Memorial Day, he had a, he couldn't make it, he was in the hospital, that's when it started, but, and he had been sick about a month before that, it's probably close to now, a year ago, he's been going through it, 
Poor Ray, God have mercy on him. Sheesh. All right. Uh, let's uh, turn to Second Corinthians chapter six. I am definitely not myself tonight, but I will do the best I can. God have mercy. Second Corinthians six. Let's look at verse fourteen. Okay, we got that. All right. <clears throat> it says, "Be not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel?" And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Seven one will stop there. Having therefore these promises, I'm going to go over that tonight. Dearly beloved, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. All right, let's pray and ask God to step in and touch our hearts. Right, Brother Sean. Amen. Okay, so we looked at a few verses here. We read a few things. Uh, I want to give you a couple of pretty simple points. One in verse 16, take a look at it, says, uh, we are the temple of the living God. So number one, temple of the living God. That's deep. Temple of the living God. All right. Number two, same, and I'm going to explain this. Number two, verse 16 also, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Is that, is that good? We're good? Yeah, we're All right. All right. Number one, we're the temple of God. Number two, we're God's people. Number three, verse 18, God your father. Look at verse 18. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So three thoughts, and then I'm going to explain the message. One, you're the temple of God. Two, you're God's people. Three, you're God's children. Now, the people of God is a church, and you're individually a child of God. Like a son or a daughter to a, to a parent. Those are, those are the promises that it says in verse 7, verse 1. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved. What promises? We just looked at them. Those are the promises he's referring to right there. Promise that you're the temple of God, God's people, and children, and you're the son of God. Those are great promises. Number one, let's look at 7.1, and here's the thought tonight. It's called cleansing ourselves, Thomas. That's the name of the message. Cleansing ourselves. So in verse 7, I mean verse 1, chapter 7, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. Those are the promises. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So you got two applications in that it's flesh and spirit. You need to cleanse yourself physically and cleanse yourself spiritually. You need to cleanse yourself from carnal sins as well as spiritual sins. Both will work. I mean, you know, getting saved, uh, drinking and smoking and doing drugs and uh, maybe bad eating habits. Uh, all those things have to go out the window, or they should. Cleanse ourselves. Who's supposed to do the cleansing? Ourselves. No one's going to do it for you. 
You got an issue in those areas. You got you got to cleanse yourself. That's physical. That's carnal. Now there's a distinction between carnal sin and spiritual sins, but make no mistake, both will hurt you. Both will eventually kill you. And so it's just because there's a distinction doesn't mean either one is good. Oh, that's only a carnal sin, really. Versus a spiritual sin, that's worse, really. Well, you know what? They're both bad. When the Lord came into the temple, speaking about the temple of God, he, he came into the temple in John chapter 2, and what did he do? He took a whip, and he knocked over the money changers' tables that they were making merchandise of the people of God. And he whipped them, and he kicked them out. He cleansed the temple of God. My Father, the house of prayer, you make it into a den of iniquity. Then it thieves. You took something holy and you defiled it. But you know what the application for us is? We're that temple of God. That's what he said. What? Know ye not that you're the temple of God? And that's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And you know, think about this for a minute. If we're the temple of God and God cleansed his own temple by scourging and, and, and knocking over it, he was knocking over those things that were dirty and vile and did not belong. How do you cleanse yourself? Get rid of that which doesn't belong in your life. Stop doing things you previously did or are tempted to do physically, carnally, and also spiritually. Spiritually, say, well, that's, I'm giving you a physical application. Uh, you know, that, that, that's the sins that we can identify. Some of the spiritual things that you might not identify could be pride, jealousy, lust, greed, uh, mean-spiritedness. All those things have to be dealt with individually as the Lord is cleansing his temple. He wants to cleanse your temple. He wants to cleanse us individually. The way he cleansed that, and that's important for us to remember that, temple of God, it's a powerful thought, and he was willing to cleanse his temple that way. What about us? We've got to cleanse ourselves. So number one, how do we cleanse ourselves the, that way, and the first point is practice. It's practice. You have to practice holiness. Right. You have to practice doing right. What righteousness? Doing, you know, we make a, a great thought of this living a righteous life. Well, whose choice is that? Your choice. How do you do it? Practice. If you practice holiness, eventually it becomes a habit. You, either, you, you're, you, you know, you do, you do something wrong, a bad habit, and then you start doing it repeatedly. And then, before you know it, it's hard to what? Break that habit. Yeah. Well, start doing some good habits. Start reading your Bible on a more regular basis, or praying, or being faithful to church, or meditating on the Word of God, or just thinking about what you want to say before you say something and then regret it. A lot, of, a lot of thought goes into being a good Christian. And that you're the temple of God. And God's temple is holy. If you could just think about that for one minute. Because that's one thought. But that's a deep thought. If you're the temple of God. And we are spiritually. And God's spirit dwells in us. We'll get there in a second. That's a, that's a wild promise. That's a promise. But it's a, what a promise that is. That we're the temple of God. That he, you know, do you realize how interested God was in the temple? When he built the temple? Read Kings, First Kings, when he built it. Seven years to build his, the temple of God. God gave him the instructions to, to Solomon. David got the blueprint. Solomon built it with help from his Hiram and everybody else he used to build. But you read, in, if you read in First Kings, the building of the temple, there is pages and page chapters devoted to every specification of that temple. That's where a builder's mind would be more helpful that than me. I've read it for 30 years, and I make notes and got what I got out of it. But a real builder would really, really probably appreciate that and, and see all the effort and the detail that went into that temple. And you say, why? We were talking the other night, Tuesday night class, and it was funny. I think Jim was kind of kidding around about Leviticus. Which, yeah, I mean, yeah, we could kid around about that. It's the word of God, but it's not, a, it's not, you know, when somebody first gets saved, you don't say, here, read Leviticus. Yeah. You, know, you know, it does reflect, like I said in my little outline, after you get saved, that Leviticus reflects 
what you're supposed to do and not do. It's the law. Exodus represents you coming out of the world, getting saved. And then the first thing you find out is now you say, well, what do I do? Do I do this? Do I do that? Am I allowed to do this? Do I do that? And you, you, you go through all those things. You read Leviticus, a lot in there. But the point being, Leviticus is not, again, the kind of book that you're going to direct the young Christian to read. But when you think about Leviticus and all those rules and laws and regulations that God put in place, and you think about, and, and you think about the temple and all the dedication he put to that temple, I mean, there is so much in there. And you say to yourself, why? What, what, what's, why? It's important to God. So here's what I had said. If, you, if your name was in, I was t- k- kidding around saying, I was telling John, the Rick is one day, I told the church, and Jonathan took it to heart. I said that if you have a hard time sleeping, read the first nine chapters of Chronicles. You're not going to read it. You're never going to make it through one or two chapters. But a little kid, the Jonathan was a young boy at the time, and his mom said, Jonathan, why, are you, you know, why is the light on your room? He said, I can't sleep. So what are you doing? I'm reading First Chronicles. He said, why are you doing that? He says, Pastor said, uh, help me go to sleep. And he did. She went back two minutes later. <laughs> he was out. He was reading names and genealogy. He's like, so, yeah, it's way out. But the point is, and I always kid around and say, what if your name was in there? Hey, I'm in here somewhere. Come on. You go through the fine tooth comb. There I am. I found, I found my name. And you'd read it more diligently. But it, it, there's no question about it. But assuming, Sean, assuming we had the same interest in it that God did, we don't, right. But if your name was in it, you'd look for it more carefully. And that's my point. And the point is that it's God's word. And if he took that much time in building the temple specifically what about you you're built without hands and you got your your physical tabernacle for a spiritual being kind of a weird dichotomy right but with that god is interested in that temple and he wants to be cleansed so how do you do it you practice keep your keep your finger on second corinthians 6 go to romans 6 Right before it, the book before it. And the reason I say the first point on practicing holiness is, I mean, you have to practice. That's how you get victory. That's how you perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord, is by practice. Okay, watch this. Yeah, here you go. Let's go. Um, 18, 19, 20. Watch. 19. Okay, Romans six eighteen. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. True? Okay. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto what? Holiness. See that? Righteous behavior produces holiness. How do you do it? Practice. Amen. Practice. That, that's, that's, that's my verse I want to show you. Go back to Second Corinthians. So the idea of practicing holiness, practice doing right. If you start, if practice doing right, eventually you're going to, you're going to live a holier life, right? Okay. Ephesians 6. Put the, therefore on the whole armor of God to be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy, right? Having done all to stand, stand against the evil day. Having the breastplate of what? Righteousness. Listen, don't be misunderstood. You heard me say this many times. That breastplate of righteousness is not Christ's righteousness. It's your righteousness. Christ's righteousness was imputed to you, was given to you. You know what that means, breastplate of righteousness? You got dressed this morning, right? You chose a shirt, whatever you put on. You, 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 you put something on. You put something on. You got to put on righteousness. 
That's your choice. Doing right. That's not Christ's righteousness. It's he's already inside of you. But you choose as a Christian to put on the right, the, ar the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, to say, I'm going to do right. Well, according to Romans, if you do right, it's going to lead to what? Holiness. Right. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves more filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, number one, you do it by practicing righteousness. And you'll start, it'll lead you down the road of being more holy. And of course, getting rid of those things that are in your life that are bad. When you, when you clean, you clean a toilet, you clean your room, you clean your car, you clean a floor, you clean, you, you clean your house, your apartment, anything, your room. You clean it and then you, you feel better that it's cleaned up. It's still the same room essentially, but it feels cleaner. And that's what the Lord's looking at. He's looking at, are you clean? He wants not to be pharisaically clean. I'm not talking about that. I mean, be clean. Be a clean vessel. A vessel meet for the master's use. Clean. And uh, a vessel that God wants to drink out of or use. And it's been cleansed. It's been prepared for every good work. And you do that by cleaning yourself. Yeah, you should, you should be concerned about your physical cleanliness, absolutely. But that's only a function of your inward cleanliness. You could focus on that and be inside, have dead men's bones and filth inside. I'm not suggesting that's a good thing either. It's clean yourself outside, clean yourself inside. Amen? Amen. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and what? Spirit. Both. Carnal sin, spirit sin. Which one's worse? The both will kill you. One, one will drink himself to death. The other one will be so prideful and never accept, accept Christ and go to hell. And both are going to hurt you. But the idea is that you're aware that the devil could use either avenue. Car car carnal court or uh, spiritual speedway. <laughs> All right, let's go on. Let's go to number two. All right, so the second thing, back to 7-1. Back to 2 Corinthians. Verse 1. Second Corinthians 7. I just went to Romans for a minute. Let's go back to Second Corinthians. That's the verse tonight. The verse tonight is Second Corinthians 7 1. Let's read it again. Everybody got this? Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness. One, practice righteousness. Two, you got to be penitent. All right? So what's that going to equate to? Look at verse 16. It says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. We already covered that. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And watch this. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall be my people. You're going to be God's people. Not only are you God's temple, you are the people of God. The church, collectively, is the people of God. <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry. The people of God. You know, Israel was the people of God in the Old Testament. Right? They're still the people of God, but they were the, old, they were the people of God in the Old Testament. There was no church. Now, they got temporarily replaced by the Christians. Not permanently. Temporarily. Don't, it's not permanent. They, they've been put on a shelf. They've been put in abeyance. But, but at the right time, they get brought back out and God deals with them. Because they will become the people of God again in the future. When we become that glorified body. But right now, he's focusing individually on his church. His body. And, and we are the people of God. That's what he says. And if we're the people of God, he says in verse 16, that he's going to he's gonna dwell in us and... Dwell in, dwell in us and they shall be my people? Well, if Israel was God's people in the Old Testament and they were warned by Jeremiah, let's say, for 40 years to change things, to remove the idols and 
the groves and the images and the high places and all the false worship that went on. You know what they did? They said, no. We've got the temple of God right here. We're okay. We don't need to change. What are you talking about, man? We are God's people. Leave me alone. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I read my Bible once. You know, whatever. They, they give you some sort of platitude. And you go, okay. But you live, you're living like the devil. You're not... You're not you, you're saying you're a Christian. You're not living like you're one. You're, oh, yeah, I believe that too. Maybe saying that half stoned out. I don't know. The, the idea is that if, you, if you've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, something should change, right? Well, he said to cleanse that temple, and Jeremiah told them, and they didn't. And they were God's people, weren't they? So they figured there's no way God is going to judge his own people. That's what they said. We got the temple of God in. God's not going to judge us. What are you talking about? <sighs> Judgment must first begin the what? House of God. Woo! Are you kidding me? We're a Christian. There's nothing happen. Well, listen, when when the Lord blows that trumpet, we're gonna we're gonna then be summoned before him and you know, give an account. We all gonna we all fall short. I don't say anything about that. We all fall short, but we're gonna, we're gonna be there. Amen. Well, at least down here you should be aware that penitence is important. Repentance, uh, a cont contrite spirit, penitence. In other words, you're if 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 Israel had took Jeremiah's message to heart and say, "Okay, Jeremiah, you're right." We're messed up. What do we do? He was at here. Do this. Get right with God. Remove these temples. Remove these idols. Do it. But they didn't say any of that. He said, no, leave me alone. We're fine. Until judgment came and they wanted to know what to do. And by that time, it was too late. So the idea that penitence or repentance is important to do on a regular basis, right? If you, if you, I don't say, you know, walk through your whole life every day. Every, listen. You need liberty. You need a balance. But when you do wrong, you need to ask God to forgive you. And just get, get that clear. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Put that, get it cleansed by the blood, by your prayer, by that act of contrition, by you saying, Lord, forgive me. I did wrong. I need your help. I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have said that. Whatever, whatever it was. And pray that prayer. You're only a prayer away from getting right with God. And that's, so the first one was practice, righteousness. Second one is, you know, penitence. Be, be quick to pray. Be quick to say you're sorry. You know, clean up your walk. Here's what you should do. I, said, I, got, I had a good idea. I said, as I was preparing this, I said, tell yourself you're the temple of God number one, right? Tell yourself you're a child of God. You're a child of God. See, that's got two things to it. I'm like, Wow, I'm a child of God, which is good, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, think about what you're saying. You're a child of God, not a child of the devil. You're a child of God. And you should then want to live like a child of God. That's the, that perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Cleanse us of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Spiritual sins like worship, false doctrine, uh, false worship where it's just you know you have to worship God in spirit and in truth that's important and when you do that that'll help you can't you know today churches and there's so many types of churches are out there and denominations that you, you it's, it's to, to a lost person that's trying to investigate Christianity probably if they really look into it probably freaks them out Wait, these are all Christians? And it, the, the list goes like this. Right? Come on. The world consider Christians. All these lists. This ding, 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 ding. I'm not going to list them all. Come on. And then you start realizing, you know, like people that have bounced around to different churches and they're trying to find a place they can just get fed. It's not that easy. Why? There's a lot of false spirits out there. A lot of... A lot of false doctrine, a lot of false preachers, and a lot of 
So that leads to uh, uh, it's bad. It's just, it's it's, it's going to be cleansed out. I think that's important when God started out. You know, he he was simple, right? He was simple. He had a few disciples, broke bread, spake to them, explained everything to them. They lived communally. It was a very simple life. As the church evolved, as centuries gone by, it became elaborate. You know, smallest country in the world is what? The smallest country in the world is the Vatican. Vatican. Smallest country is the Vatican. And the Vatican, yet smallest country, has one of the greatest influence, greatest influences throughout the world. It can, the little, that little country, point, point two, you know, a fifth of a mile, square mile, controls so many, so many, so many countries. Unbelievable. A lot of stuff going on. Small little thing, but has a lot of power. Uh, and so you say, well, they've been blessed of God. Look how big they are. Look how powerful they are. And some people could say that in defense of the Catholicism. Right? We're bigger, we're better. Yeah. Eh, come on. I'm, I'm, you look, right, amen, right? That's an argument they could use. Bigger, better. And you, you can't deny that. They're bigger. Not necessarily better. So the thing is, you've got to realize that we, we, we understand that learning these truths, it's for us personally. Saying, look at my big cathedral could be a sign of God's blessing or might not be. I don't know. It depends how you got it. Got it? it depends how you got it. When they built St. Peter's Basilica, you know what they built that on? They built it on the, the false doctrine of purgatory. Peter's Pence. The biggest, that's the biggest Catholic church in the world. Built on a false pretense. Tell me that's not, that's not wicked. And it must be a magnificent church as far as goes. As far as it, aesthetically. Sistine Chapel, I mean it's got to be spectacular as a building, as an edifice goes. But what was the premise behind building it? False doctrine that you're going to get people out of souls out of purgatory into heaven. What? whole thing is crazy. And people that didn't have anything gave their money. So they build this thing that they felt they were doing an indulgence and sparing their soul years in purgatory. Yeah. All wicked stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's false. That's false. We, you know, we have a small church and, you know, for better or for worse, that's what we got. That's it. And, but, but the Word of God is pure. And I put it out as best I can. And I keep it simple, right to, the, right to the truth. And with that, the idea is you're supposed to grow individually. Amen. You're the temple of God. You're a child of God. You need to grow individually. It's about individual relationship with Jesus Christ. I was getting my car wash today. I had that, that good deal down there at Medford. And I was, this guy was standing next to me. He was an older gentleman. And he had a Vietnam vet hat on. So a nice fellow, you know. And he was chatting about his car. He had an older Lexus in really nice condition, and he was friendly and talkative and started chatting up. So as we were talking a little bit, I felt the Lord say, you know, give this guy a track. So as we finished our conversation, talking, he's a nice, really nice fella. We chatted about cars a little bit. I go to give him a track. He says, oh, praise the Lord. You a Christian? I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm a Bible teacher. Uh, for 40 years or something. He was in, in, in Vietnam, and, you know, the, the Tet Offensive. 67 is crazy as well. And uh, he looked pretty, he was deaf. He was deaf. He, he, he was in good health. He looked good, but he was deaf. And he walked a little, you know, kind of, yeah, Vietnam. And he was deaf. So he couldn't hear, I didn't look, look at him and talk clearly. But he said, I'm a Bible teacher. His name was Walter. Wait, you're a pastor? Yeah. I mean, just, what a, you never know. I really felt like the guy needs the Lord. He's, he's a Christian. He's a praise the Lord. You don't know. You have no way. You can't always tell. He's still a nice fellow. You know? And, 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 you know, well, thank God. You, you, know, you know, the point is, he's a child of God. I didn't know that. Didn't hear. I'm going to go there. I'm going to show that in a minute. He, we, I wouldn't have known by looking at him. I mean, he's still a nice fellow. And he started talking. He was friendly. And I said, well, at least let me just give him a track. 
Vietnam vet and this and that and figured, you know, you don't know how it's going to go. Turns out to be a Christian all these years. I said, oh, praise the Lord. Where's your church? And I told him about it. He goes to some church in Belport. I asked him if he knew Amanda. He said, I do, but he, and it must have been a different Amanda. That was funny. In Belport, when you had met somebody too, Jim. Remember in Belport? It was, it, that you met the girl that we knew, Amanda? You, yes, yeah. Well, it was Victory Baptist Church, he said. That's the name of the church. I didn't know where that is offhand. Do you know anything in Belport, Sean? I'm not sure there's a couple churches going down that road. I'm not sure we can Victory Baptist. I said, wow, well, that's good. Praise the Lord. So left at that, and that was it. You know, I'm probably never seen him again, but Walter, and he's saved. So praise the Lord for that. He's got part of God's people. We're scattered about. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's look at something else. <clears throat> Tell yourself that you're a child of God. It's two things so far. Tell yourself you're, you're, you're the temple of God. You house God. Wow. I know. That's the, you know, the Catholic Church did that crazy thing, that monstrance, right? Where they put the host in that gold cup of the little house. For, that's like the house for God. Wait a minute. We, we are the temple of the living God. And he dwells inside of us. That's a powerful thought. Number one, so tell yourself that you're the temple of God. Two, tell yourself you're a child of God. You will practice righteousness. You'll live a more holy life. Practice righteousness. Secondly, practice penitence. Be quick to pray. Be quick to say, I'm sorry. Forgive me, Lord. If we, if we confess our sins, sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a powerful verse. It doesn't say you're a Christian never going to sin. No, you're going to sin. Confess it. Forsake it and ask God to give you strength and not to compete. Continue committing the same sin. And one day you won't because you'll be gone. You'll be in glory. Amen. And you can't commit the sin anymore. So down here it's going to be a struggle sometimes. Oh my God, besetting sin. All right, let's look at something else. Go back to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Lastly, I'd like to say this. We are also God's children. We are the people of God in that we are the church. But now individually, you're a child of God. So the church collectively would be called the people of God. Okay? Individually, you're a child of God. Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. What, what keeps you in connection? Look what it said in verse 18. Back, yeah, I just read 7 1. Look at 6 18, the verse right before it. And will be a father unto you. Everybody see that? And ye shall be my what? Say it. Sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You, you're a child of God, son and daughter. So. How do you talk to your father? Prayer. Prayer. Yeah, respectfully, but in prayer. So, well, I mean, you're in our Heavenly Father, we talk, we're, we're a child of God, we speak to our Father by prayer. So we practice holiness, practice righteousness. We're, we should be penitent, quick to pray, forgiveness. And thirdly, pray. Pray to the Father. Pray to the Father in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. That'll keep you in communion with God. Prayer, right? So prayer, a seemingly, almost like, a, I don't know, almost like a, to somebody that doesn't know, would be like kind of strange behavior. Who are you speaking to? You're just like praying and so you're not, I don't see anybody. Who are you talking to? What are you saying? And you're closing your eyes, you're praying. And as a Christian, you're praying to your Father. And God hears that prayer. Men ought always to pray and not faint. That's right. Seven days without prayer makes one what? Weak. Play on words. Seven days without prayer makes one weak. Well, that's true. I mean, you, know, you have to pray to stay in fellowship with God. And if you, if you do that, that's how you know you're a child of God. One of, the, one of the ways you know you're a child of God is God hears your prayers. Isn't it good when you pray something specifically that nobody knows but you? Good evening, church. 
and God answers your prayer? And you know nobody would have known that but God. Right? You with me? Phil, remember the movie Risen? When the Roman soldier, that's the perspective of that movie, <clears throat> this centurion that's overseeing the crucifixion of the Lord, Lord who's a non-believer, he's, he's a soldier, he's a hardened soldier. He sees the Lord die. Okay, did my job. He tells Pilate, he goes, takes a Roman bath, and he's talking to Pilate after the long day. He's like exhausted. And he says, what do you long for? And he, and he said a few things like peace and uh, a day with no more death and worry or he whatever he said now the lord when he meets him after he realized that he's alive he saw him in the upper room alive and this he watched him die and he says now he's alive he goes i can't reconcile this what's going on I, he's flipped out well he eventually starts following the disciples and the point is when he finally ha has an encounter with the lord the lord says to him what do you long for flavius what, what's what do you want and before he can even answer it the lord tells him what he said that day in the bath after he cruci watched the crucifixion of the Lord. He repeats him the same words. And at that moment, how could the same words verbatim? And he looked at him, and then that's when he was like, What 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 are you what are you doubting? He was like, Wow, okay, I got it, I got it. He got it like, no, 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 that there's no way he would have known that. I muttered this in private in front of Punch's pilot. And here the Lord's telling me what I said that night after he died on the cross. That, that flipped him out. That's the way the Lord will do it to you. He'll, he'll do something and it'll be a direct answer to your prayer because he loves you, he's concerned about you, and you're a child of God. You, and as a result of that, you pray and God shows you. I said it many times, I'll say it again, when that rooster crowed that second time that night, it was nothing, it crowed the same time every morning. Maybe at 4.30, I don't know. And they crow. And that, but that morning when he crowed, it was the sign that Peter needed to see what the Lord said was true. This night, before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he just denied him a third time. And then immediately, it says immediately, the cock crow. Now that didn't have meant nothing to anybody else. Right? But to him, it meant everything. Why? That was God showing him. And God could do that to us. And when you pray something specifically, God might show you that. And then you know that was from God. Right? And that shows you're a child of God. We're going to go there in a minute. I want to show you a verse. It's like this, too. You have a, your own family, and you know. And mom, dad, and kids. and You talk to them. They talk to you. You have a re different relationship maybe with each child. But you know who they are. They know who you are. Well, God knows who you are. And do you know who God is? And when you talk to him, you talk to him through prayer, he wants to hear from you. It's like a parent wants to hear from the child. Tell me, son, what's going on? Or tell me, honey, what's happening? What's going on in your life? You need to tell me. No, no. You don't say anything. And you, your parent wants to hear. Right? And Father's like, God knows already, but he wants us to tell him. He wants us to talk to him. Communication is important in relationships. Some couples getting married soon. Communication is going to be very important for us as well as them. And for you as a Christian with God. How to communicate with God. Pray. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. So if we are the temple of God, we should practice righteousness. If we are God's people, we should be penitent. And thirdly, we're the children of God sons and daughters, we should pray. That's how we speak to them. So look at 1 John 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. Everybody got that? Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called, say it, church, the what? Sons of God. 
Therefore the world knoweth, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The world doesn't identify you as a son of God. They don't know who you are. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. Wow. Now look at verse 3. And every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Amen. There it is. Righteous, holy, perfecting fear, holiness and the fear of God. So the idea that we're a child of God, we're the son of God, children of God, we should walk in a way that's consistent with being a Christian. We should understand that. The world doesn't know that you're a child of God. But God knows. How do you know? Well, you know. Do you talk to your father? Do you pray? If you pray, pray, pray about your direction in your life. Pray about um, what to do next. Uh, problems that arise in your family. Pray about it. Pray about for grace in your own life. To have grace with people, help to deal with people. Pray for wisdom. Pray for understanding. Pray for better knowledge and application of the scriptures you're learning. Pray. Pray to be you. Pray to, that you'd be more obedient. You'd, you'd obey what God wants you to do. Pray that we wouldn't be so stiff-necked and stubborn. Help us. Pray. That's one of the ways you know you're God. I mean, I'm married. We're married. My wife and I are married 37 years this August. So we're married. Really, we know each other very well. We know all idiosyncrasies about each other. But we still talk. We still talk to each other a lot. So why? We know we know a lot. Well, we talk to each other. You, you talk to your father, right? Talk to, you, talk to those you love. You, you, you say things to them. You talk to, you, talk to the Lord. He talks to us. When you read the Word of God, He's speaking to you. When you pray, when you read, you pray to God, you speak to Him. When you open the Bible and read, He speaks to you. Say, Lord, show me something from your Word of God. As you read, sit down and read and say, show me something. Meditate on something, whatever it might be. It might be a verse that day that speaks to you. It might be on your calendar, or it might be in your daily Bible reading, or it might be a proverb, it might be a psalm, it might be what you're reading in the Scriptures. Or it might be you finished reading and you just meditate, you open it up and you say, Lord, show me something. And God might just pop something out. I had a whole other message prepared, and I, you know, it, it's still good because it's the Word of God, okay? Make, make, make no misunderstanding. I'm not saying I'm the greatest preacher. I'm just saying I had a message prepared. It would have been fine. But as I was praying, and I said, I don't know. Yeah, my points were out. It was, all, it was good. Prayed about it. And then I kind of was meditating, flipped around. And it's hit that verse, hit me. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I said, there it is. There's the verse. That's the verse. So we practice righteousness. We should be quick to be penitent, to be contrite. And thirdly, pray. Talk to Heavenly Father. Stay in communion with Him. Sister Leek wrote you a letter. Now, by the way, I did, I was remissful, in, uh, was remiss in one area. On Sunday, I forgot to mention about Brother Leek. It was one year. It was Easter last year. Resurrection Sunday, he, he, yeah. And I knew it, I knew what I said to myself. Well, I don't know if it was the same act, correct. Yeah, true. I don't know the date specifically. But Easter, it hit me. Like that when that, he died in Easter. Whether it was the exact year, but true. He may have been off by a few weeks or a week, I don't know. But it hit me to, remem to remind everybody about that. And it, it, it was in my mind, I forgot to say it. Then you get a letter from Mrs. Leake. How, Brent. She did. Well, the letter was very, you know, exuberant. And she was talking about wanting to be with the Lord, wanting to be with her husband. That's what that letter said to me. The letter said, I want to go home to be with him. And the rapture's close, so I want to get out of here. But you know what? Because we don't, we don't know who we are, Son of God. Nobody knows that. People you work with. People you live a track with. Um, some are interested, some aren't. Even a young Spanish fellow was a nice guy today. Yeah, pleasant. pleasant fellow, a very nice fellow. You, know, you don't know. Who, you know, they hear things you don't know. But one day they'll, one day they'll know who you are. 
One day we'll, we'll know who we are. <laughs> we'll be, be revealed who we really are. Because we go through this world just, you know, trudging through the kind of the mundane chores of life. Sometimes grudgingly, sometimes happy, and sometimes forgetting that we're a son of God, we're a child of God, and we have a, an appointed end, a destination that'll make all this seem insignificant. In the meantime, what do you got to do? Occupy till I come. Amen. Keep doing the chores. Amen? Yes. Keep going forward. Is that right? Yes. Just keep doing what you got to do. And don't get too discouraged because you're on the winning side. Yes. No matter what else happens in life, you're saved. You already answered the most important question that the world doesn't know. I mean, uh, plenty of people know it, but a lot of people don't. More people don't know what they know it. I'll say that. And the idea that you are of a... The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction. That, that's what it says. And now is the way that leads to what? Life. So you're on the narrow path. I don't, don't know how narrow it is. I just know it's a narrow path. I know the broad way is the wrong way. And you're on the right, you're on the straight path, like Pilgrim's Progress. And the idea that we're on that Pilgrim's Progress, we're on the straight path, we're going the right way, even though it's narrow, I, I know we're headed the right direction. And, and the devil knows that too. And he tries to launch attacks on you to hurt you to get you off course, to mess us up while we're going the right way, fighting upstream like that salmon, swimming upstream against the current of the world, trying to do right. But ultimately, one day, it'll, you'll, you'll know him as he is, and you're gonna be, it'll be manifested who you are, son of God, temple of God, ch- you are family of God, you, you are the people of God, the church, and individually, you're a child of God. All three are true. Having, therefore, these promises. Those are some great promises. Amen? Amen. Yeah. It's a great promise to say, thank you, Lord. Amen. Sometimes just say, look, thank you, Lord, I'm a child of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, I'm a son of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you chose to put your Holy Spirit in me, and I'm a temple of God. Help me to keep it clean. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's it for tonight. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd be with us. Help us. Protect us. Take these truths in, like Sean said. Apply it. Certainly there's things in our lives that we can clean up. Always, continually. It's like maintenance on a car or a house. It never ends. You have to always do something. Something in your life, your walk. Keep it as clean as you can. You never know when the Lord will blow that trumpet. So let us do right. Help us to, to want to do right, Lord. Help us to practice righteousness that we might live a more holy life. Give us direction. Help us be penitent, quick to say we're sorry. And Father, pray and talk to you. Have communication. Be with us. Get us home safe. Have mercy upon Ray. Raise him up. Help him tonight. Help the Ricker family. Uh, Be with them, all that's going on. There's a lot going on in the Ricker family tonight. Have mercy, Lord. Just physically bring a healing to Ray and peace to his heart. Thank you for us. Get us home safe. And thank you for all you do for us, Lord. Help us to feel better. um, and Strengthen us for the upcoming weekend. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.